Happy Friday, everybody. Welcome to the Independent Investor Channel. My name is Ryan. We're coming to you from Virginia Beach, Virginia. Um, kind of a serious topic tonight, absolutely. This is kind of where we, we flip the script a little bit on investing. You know, um, I think it's been very, very easy to buy into the euphoria that's been presented over the last 10 years or so of, of investing. And uh, got a few questions through the community, through the Facebook group uh, this week um, that was focused on um, timing the market. Okay. And even though there is no real way to time the market at all, it is absolutely in our best interest to acknowledge where the current stock market is, um, why, it, why it's run up, um, what are some potential headwinds um, that could potentially derail this market. And they, they are out there. Um, unfortunately, as I've always professed, the media is doing everything that they can possibly do to feed into this euphoria. And it really does very little to help the individual investor that's trying to get ahead. All right. So a lot of the message this evening is going to be to discuss what it is that we do. Now, I've made some pretty critical moves this week, that of which I will be sharing with you guys um, throughout the course of this live feed. But I think it really buys into some Warren Buffett principles in that, you know, when, when everybody else is buying, you, you should be looking to sell stock. And I don't want to scare anybody who's part of the community and over the last two years have, have built up, you know, a little bit of uh, a little bit of personal wealth by deploying some of the techniques that we teach on the independent investor channel. There's another element as well. When we talk about scaling into the market, we also talk about uh, strategically buying down the market a little bit and strategically kind of scaling out of the market when appropriate. Now, keep in mind, I advocate for a buy and hold philosophy. A buy and hold philosophy is a fairly loose term in that just because I own a name like Apple doesn't mean that I have to have maximum exposure in Apple at any one given time. And Apple is just one of those examples of a stock that I actually took some profits from um, this week. Uh, and I, just to kind of let you guys know, right at the top here, I've actually had some um, some uh, suggestions on the live feed to actually timestamp because um, uh, many of you guys who are joining the live feed, um, we do this now uh, pretty regularly on every Friday. Um, I'm going to start to timestamp some of the discussions that we have throughout the course of the live feed. And that'll actually be a lot easier to go into after the live feed um, and find some of those critical topics that I want to hit on every Friday. And, and believe me, the, the topic of finances is, is infinite. It really is. I and mean, we're going to really try to curtail um, our discussion tonight about what it is that we do about this stock market. And I don't, I don't want to scare anybody out of the stock market. But uh, again, I, I watched again, my, my friend, every now and then, my friend Jeremy with the Financial Education Channel throws a video up there that is just too intriguing not to spend a few minutes watching. And I watched his video about his $128,000, $782 portfolio um, that he's exposing to the stock market um, using single stock allocation. And um, I, I wish everyone the best. I really do. I don't wish ill will on anybody. I, I don't want to see anybody get hurt in the stock market. But in my particular experience, and I've got 25 years of experience in the stock market, um, that is a recipe for disaster in a stock market like this, especially with headwinds starting with uh, tariffs going into effect as early as next week. Um, we have um, midterm elections coming up in November, right around the corner here, guys. Um, we also have historically one of the worst months to invest in the stock market, and that is my birth month, ironically enough, which is September of every year, um, is traditionally a bad time to be exposed to the stock market. Now, Historical events do not forecast future returns, nor do I advocate for anyone 
ever looking to project that the market is going to go down tomorrow or next week, or it's not going to continue on this bull run that we've experienced. But at the end of the day, I really think it's very, very prudent for each and every one of you guys to observe where you started, where you are now, and make some conscious decisions about a potential, a potential for maybe scaling back some profits or depending on the amount of exposure that you have to the stock market, leave it alone, but continue to start to build some cash reserves on the side. And that really is a lot of the defensive philosophy that I tend to gravitate toward a lot on my channel. I love talking about stocks and appreciation and compounding interest, but it is unfair of anybody who has any level of experience and has worked through um, recessions in the past to not acknowledge this with a potential group of folks who over the last couple of years have been exposed to the stock market for the first time. Okay. And I don't mean to be a wet towel. Okay. It's exciting to be watching the stock market, but I have so much experience that I watch the stock market and I start to make too much money. And the more money I make, the more nervous I get about it being a little bit overheated at this point. Um, we have the Federal Reserve looking to raise rates. Okay, they've been on, you know, a, a raising of rates schedule here, um, and I think with a few headwinds that are going on, some of the bigger economies are actually being shaken right now. China, especially, um, if if those reverberations in China echo in the U.S. stock market, guys, stocks go down way faster than they go up. Okay, they go up on a step and they come down in an elevator. All right. So I just want to remember, this is kind of going to be the focus of our discussion this evening. I'm going to get to a large group that's actually here um, this evening and, and try to discuss a lot of different questions. I know some of the plank owners have some questions they want to throw it my way, but I will just let you guys know within the first 10 minutes here, my allocation to the stock market has dropped from about a hundred percent exposure in each of my Roth IRAs. I parlayed that back um, to about a 60, 40 split. Okay. So this is kind of why I offer a lot of the portfolio building tools that I offer to you guys. Okay. And depending on your age and risk tolerance, a 100% percent stock portfolio can be absolutely prudent for you. Okay. You cannot buy into the traditional, recommended portfolio structures. Okay. You can't always buy into those because I think a lot of those portfolios or model portfolios that are put out there are built to get assets under management for the people who are advertising those model, model portfolios. What they fail to disclose to you is that stock portfolios give you the best chance for appreciating and building wealth over time. The ironic part about it is, is they don't make money by investing their clients into single stock for them. And they full well know that a lot of new investors require a lot more maintenance if they're looking to buy a stock and it shoots up 20% and they're constantly calling their broker, hey, can you sell this? I want to I want to cash out. They know that it's a headache. All right. So it's somewhat contrary to what they want to recommend to you. And you guys remember my video on divulging paths. This is exactly where the goals of the financial plan are, don't necessarily always align with the goals of the individual investor. All right. And I really want you guys to keep that in mind. Keep that in the back of your guys' head as we're working through this discussion about the potential for timing the market, defensive positioning, defensive strategies. Guys, you have to approach the stock market like it is a war. OK, and if you fail to do that, I feel like and, and as I was watching that video from Jeremy on the financial education channel, I honestly got the feeling that he was throwing that portfolio up there just to put it through the channel because it's been 700 videos deep. And that's the first video that I've seen where he's actually disclosed that he has real dollars invested to the stock market. My fear for Jeremy is that he's exposing a lot of dollars to the stock market right here at a record high. I almost feel like he's he, he's he's reinventing some of the old uh, customs and some of the old uh, habits that really got him in trouble when he lost all that money. 
um, back in the downturn of 2009, 2008. So um, I, I, I can't believe I, I just got a, a $20 tip. I'm thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for the support. Um, I actually filmed this evening my portfolio review for my M1 brokerage account. A lot of you guys are going to find a lot of value in that. Um, I've taken $10,000 and I've put a stake in that. Um, all of my YouTube earnings will flow over to the M1 account. Um, I've said many, many times I've yet to take one single dime of compensation for my time on YouTube. Um, I can't disclose what I've made on YouTube, um, but I, I, I've made a little bit enough to kind of start a little bit of flow of some funds over and start dollar cost averaging the M1 account. So basically I have my YouTube as my money engine and then I've got M1 finance that I've built the aggressive portfolio in and I have 10 holdings in that and I will be actually walking you guys into that pie and sharing that with my community uh, through probably a five or a six minute upload. I'll probably upload that either tomorrow or Sunday. Uh, so please stay tuned for that. I, I somewhat apologize to the group a little bit in that I've been stoking the YouTube fire with the live feeds every Friday. Make no mistake, that has been for very, very specific reasons. Um, I haven't had a, a lot of time to do the uploads and the editing that's necessary on the regular YouTube schedule. We will be getting back on that schedule to so stand by for that. Teresa, thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. Um, I almost feel like I should do a, a mini financial plan for you at $20, but you guys know that the compensation really isn't part of my program through YouTube. I honestly do this uh, for you guys and the success of the channel will be built in each and every one of you guys and your degree of taking you from a starting point uh, to a point where you feel somewhat financial savvy and tackling a stock market that's extremely difficult to navigate nowadays. A lot of people are looking at it and they're like, this is easy money. And yes, it is easy money, but you have to think a little bit contrarian every now and then and think, is this the time for me to be investing in six gear or should I dial back and maybe throttle back and maybe shift down into second gear and, and look to maybe build some cash reserves up? OK, and there's no right or wrong answer for you uh, as long as it makes sense for you. All right. So, guys, welcome to the group. I'm going to start to kind of get to some of this stuff. Um, I'm going to work from the top down. Um, I've, I've got a very, very big group in here. Uh, so, guys, welcome. I, I really appreciate um, all the support. Um, I've got a couple channel creators in the group. I already see Brent in there. Um, and then I've got my wonder, wonder kid. I hope he doesn't mind me calling him that. But Benjamin is a young investor. Um, and, I, and I hope he's reaching a lot of young people because, you know, the secret to compounding is to get folks um, really kind of in, in, the, in the zone and in the groove as early as possible. Um, and um, we certainly want to make sure that we're reaching as many young people as we can to get them started off on the right foot. Okay. I always say that it's almost better not to invest than to invest in the stock market incorrectly. And there is an infinite ways of investing in the stock market incorrectly, make no mistake. And I see people make mistakes all the time and some of them are very, very costly. All right, I'm gonna start to work down some of these questions. Um, I had a little discussion with my group before I popped on here, that was pretty cool. Um, uh, what do you think of General Electric? I don't have a choice but to think about General Electric in a positive light. It actually moved north a little bit after hours today. I'm not really sure what that was about, but it's kind of forming a base here at 13. Uh, in between 12 and 13, I own the, the, the stock. Um, and even though I've, I've parlayed back on some of my stock, I have not sold any GE. Um, I want to see that position turn around. Um, and uh, I'm willing to wait it out. Uh, I took a shot on General Electric, a couple of pieces of their business I'm, I'm still very excited about, um, and I don't mind owning it. With regard to what is going to shake out Wednesday with the NAFTA 2 trade agreement with Canada, I would stay away from autos. It's not one of my favorite subsectors anyway. Um, I do love industrials. Um, I do not like autos. I really don't. And I don't care what auto company you're going to propose to me. Um, I, I, I like Ferrari um, with race. That's a good one. Um, but I, I wouldn't touch Ford right here at all. I'm not I'm not tempted at all. General Motors. I'm not tempted at all. Um, General Electric. I am. a. a I've got 150 shares of General Electric currently and I'm waiting that out um, down a 
pretty significant amount. I think I'm down around 15% in the position. I believe I entered into it around $18. Um, thought I was catching a falling knife at the right time, which I broke my own rule and I'm getting punished for it. So Hector, thank you for the question. I appreciate it. I got Jake on the line. Um, one, one of my, uh, one of my service members, man. Nice to see. You. I acknowledge have a nice Labor Day this weekend. Please enjoy yourself, guys. I just picked up some shares of ZTE. Um, it's pretty good. That I, it's not really a stock that I cover. Um, I've been actually looking at parlaying back. You guys threw a lot of uh, MJ stocks into the community, and I hopefully recommended that we take some profit in some of that. They've been coming back significantly. I know Kronos moved up again today. Um, but uh, certainly volatile stocks, and I, I want to see those volatile or higher risk assets coming after you've built the preliminary baselines in your portfolio. So make sure that you're not opting for that, that high growth money at the expense of good quality baseline and diversified products uh, in your accounts. Remember, we're trying to get up to that first $10,000. Uh, to start, okay, before we start to enter into some single stock allocation, unless you've got a 401k to rest against as well. And that way we can justify expanding the portfolio out that way. All right. Uh, loving the live feeds. I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for you guys to come in here. Um, I'm going to try to hit all the questions tonight if I can. I've got David Mathis here. Hi, everyone. I will say something now so I can just soak up your collective wisdom by listening during the live session. Thanks, Ryan, for getting us together. Yeah, I, 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 again, I don't mean to be a wet towel on this uh, on this topic. I've got Benjamin Levy. Yo, yo, yo. That's his trademark. That's a, Everybody says I need one of those catch lines or tag lines or whatever the hell you call it. Um, I, I'd like to earn my audience um, uh, without trickery. Uh, but uh, I guess now in today's society and the social media platform, I need a tagline. Um, but uh, I, I guess good luck to your investment future is my tagline, I guess, or something. I don't know. Um, it was coming to you straight from New York City for a long time, but uh, you guys know we've changed that. Uh, sold off position in Kronos this week, 60%. Probably a very good move. I've got AVA. Um, I've got Brent in the financial investor. Hey, Ryan, end of August. Yeah, hold it, buckle your safety belt, I think, for September. It's traditionally been one of those months that I would have just assumed forget um, and not been an investor. I've been wanting to safeguard some cash on the sideline for quite some time, and I'm very pleased that I've done that. Um, with the aggressive portfolio in M1 that I've started, and it is aggressive, I've got 10 high-growth names in there. Um, I've got uh, Facebook, Google. I've got NVIDIA, Alibaba, Amazon, Salesforce. Um, we're looking at JD.com. I did throw some Apple exposure in there. Uh, I put PayPal in there as well. And I've got one other ones, but I will touch on those uh, specifically when I get in and do the screenshot of the portfolio overview when I offer that to my subscriber base uh, for you guys. So you can have some visibility on if you're out there and you're trying to make the decision on what brokerage account to go with, I'll show you what I feel is one of the premier options. And thanks to Brent for turning me onto that. I'm 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 sold. I'm I'm still trying to get used to navigating. It's a fairly simple platform. I'm not sure if it's the best for uh, research. Um, so the verdict is out just a little bit, but it is certainly uh, meeting my uh, my need as a customer through in one. I like the partial shares. Um, I like the pie aspect. Um, I like the fact that you can trade for free, you can rebalance for free. That's helping a lot. So um, it's fitting what I need it for. So um, stand by for that. It'll probably be tomorrow or Sunday. Congratulations on your 60%, man. That feels really good. Um, I, I would take your profit and run on that. Nyella is here from, from Canada. Hello to you. Um, I've got Daryl Rika. Good evening. Glad to be here. Uh, it's great to have you uh, sit back, enjoy, um, have a drink. Um, I'm having green tea this evening. Uh, have a drink of choice, man. We'll have a cocktail together. We can uh, talk finances. And again, it's it's kind of one of those dirty topics that I, I hate to be, you know, the, the bearer of reality in the stock market. But it, I tend to try to be a little bit of a buffer you know, when I've got other channels out there with close to a few hundred thousand subscribers, 
you know, offering a portfolio that's being just heavily exposed to the stock market right here. I will I will call a, a, a foul on that type of approach every single time. I, I think right now the prudent move is to scale into this market at best. OK. Um, hey, Ryan, what's your strategy on paying taxes at the end of the year for dividends and interest? Thanks for the self-directed preaching. I've got Sash with a very, very good question. Um, so Sash, very simple. In the self-directed Roth IRA accounts, I do dividend reinvest my capital gains and dividends. Um, obviously, no tax in there. Obviously, those are uh, pre-tax dollars that are going into the Roth. And I don't want to get too much into taxes. Good grief. We've already started off on such a boring topic of defensive positioning. Uh, but I do some strategic trading in my brokerage account. And that is probably what you are referring to. Um, I have actually put into my brokerage account now around 20,000, uh, which is about 10% of the, the, the money or the asset portfolio that I've got right now into fixed equities. Um, right now I've only got about three holdings. Um, I did liquidate some positions in the brokerage account and I am left with McDonald's in the brokerage account. Um, I am left with Merck, um, and I am left with one other major holding, I believe, it's not coming to my head, but the six fixed equities I have in the brokerage account. But typically, um, I'll take shorter positions in stock, uh, look to get a, a quick five, six, ten, whatever it is of appreciation or jump in the stock. I'll jump on it, uh, hoping to get some appreciation, and then I'll just be taxed as earnings. Um, I typically never hold a stock beyond a year in my brokerage account. As a matter of fact, my short positions um, are usually in and out in a couple of days um, and even as short as a couple of hours. OK, um, I, I don't recommend that you do that. OK, um, I do that in my brokerage house because I've got, you know, the, the Roth IRAs um, are, are getting paid dividends. I've got very safe investments in there that are growing and paying me every day. I don't need to trade in and out of those positions, okay? Um, but when it comes time for tax season at the end, um, very simple, I've been with this same, I've done my taxes through TurboTax for the last maybe six, seven, eight years, I guess, um, and the tax software allows you to import your 1099 divs and interest into your tax software, and it shows you every trade confirmation that you have there um, that is not protected by the Roth IRA. And it's very simple, very simple. It's just taxed as earnings. So for example, last year I was able to trade up an, an extra $10,000 to basically cap my income. I, I paid whatever taxes that was because my income um, increased by $10,000. So whatever the taxable piece to that was, I just imported it into the tax software and it took care of it for me. So that's what I do. And any brokerage house will allow you to do that uh, to import your tax documents, your 1099 dibs and interest into your tax software. It is the only way that I recommend doing that. Don't try to do it uh, with a pen and a paper and manually enter them into there. You're going to, you're going to want some Tylenol after you're done with it. If, if you're even successful at doing so, uh, it's a pain in the neck. You've got to figure out how to import it into the tax, tax software. Finally made it to a live show. What a treat. Teresa, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you. Um, and I will look out for your neon green tea if you want a specific question answered. Um, I'm certainly here at your guys' disposal. Uh, let you guys know what I did with my portfolio this week. Um, strong moves in the stock market this week. Um, I actually made the moves on, on Wednesday, um, which was uh, seemingly decent timing. I, I, I really didn't care. I don't want to tell you that you can time the market and just sell at this all-time high. I just really would recommend that you guys take a hard look at where you started and where you are now. And if there's any room whatsoever to safeguard or continue your investments and build cash, you need to take a hard look at your portfolio. And this is where everybody in this group can really benefit to my perspective, guys. And I may be dead wrong. I may be dead wrong. The, the, the stock market has a very weird way of humbling even the best, most savvy investors. I'm not one of those. I'm not, a, I'm not an analyst, okay? 
a lot of my expertise comes from experience and, and working through the trenches in the stock market, okay? And I'm not trying to sell you on anything. I'm just trying to give you my opinion about actual moves that I'm making because I do forecast and see some real headwinds in this market where we've been the, the, the tailwind of the earnings start and the tax breaks at the end of this year, guys, those are done. They are done. They are baked in, if not more than baked into the stock market right now. Valuations are starting to get stretched. The, the common price of the stock in the S&P 500 at an average is at a historic high right now. Uh, we've had all of five stock splits the entire uh, year of 2017. Um, so all these big stocks that you're seeing, Amazon, even Apple, Google, these high priced stocks, Apple, probably not. But a lot of these booking.com, um, you know, of course, Berkshire, a, a lot of these really good companies um, that are increasing in stock price, they would have traditionally split. They are not splitting. And that is appeasing the uh, institutional investor not the individual investor. And that's another reason why I really like M1 is because you can start to accumulate these partial shares in some of these really high cost uh, stock out there like Google, NVIDIA, um, you know, Alibaba. A lot of people look at a stock and they say, good grief, how am I going to buy exposure to Google? Well, you can do it by placing, you know, a couple hundred dollars into the partial share of, let's say, for example, Google through M1. A lot of brokerage accounts don't allow you to do that. Um, as a matter of fact, M1 is the only one that I've seen that allows you to do that. So a pretty cool feature. Um, but uh, I've got Doug Whitaker, um, just like Kronos. <laughs> yep. Uh, happy Friday, everyone. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, picked up. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, SWK Skyworks is an awesome company. I should have should have actually thought about that in my uh, M1 account this week. Look like a great buy for a long hold and a 50 year dividend. Yeah, that that's a good pickup right there. Um, I'm going to relook at that actually, Brent. Thank you for that. That's great. Um, IR is what I picked up. Uh, better dividend yield and a strong industrial company. Awesome. Thank you for that. I've got Rohan on the line. Hey, Ryan, if someone already has matching 401k set up within the company, how should he build his Roth? Should he still add ETFs or single stock in the Roth? I love this question. <laughs> I, I love this question. Uh, so many people can benefit from my philosophy and perspective on this. So please, if you are interested at all in the answer to this question, please perk up and pay attention, okay? Because this is a core fundamental portfolio acknowledgement to your total overall financial health. If you guys are out there and you have a 401k, you are in the driver's seat to set up a self-directed account in a little bit more of an aggressive manner than if you did not have the 401k, okay? What I mean by that is, is if you got your 401k, and believe me, guys, you need to pay attention to where your money is going in your 401k. If it means going to your HR department or it means logging into those accounts, guys, I've done it for my friends specifically, okay? You get the login. You get the password, okay? It's the world we live in. Get into that account and actually see where your money is going, okay, by whatever the sponsoring brokerage house is, whatever the sponsor, whether it be Vanguard or Fidelity, whoever it is, make sure that the fund is in line with what you want to get out of your life and make sure that it's in line with your financial goals and your risk tolerance, okay? Now, with that said, a lot of the 401ks and employee-sponsored programs that are out there do offer the company match. You have to take the company match. Now, if you have the means to max out your 401k, which for a lot of people, myself included, $18,000 of my income is a lot to devote to a 401k. Do you have to do a full 18000 I believe not, Okay. What I believe is that you should contribute up to where you get the maximum free money, okay, and then look to start the self-directed account on top of your 401k. So you have the diversified, pick out an S&P 500 index fund, 
uh, in your 401k and that exposure is already set. Okay. So you don't need to duplicate your efforts and have overlap in your self-directed account. What I want to see you guys do is look to build that portfolio out with a little bit more of a, of a stock exposure. Okay. So if you guys have, you know, a good baseline setup, let's say you've got 10,000 that you've been devoting to a 401k, take my advice, log into that account, be proactive with your money and, and know where it's going and be confident in the dollar cost average program. Just continue to pump. You don't need to look at that but once a year, okay? E e even once a year, you don't even have to do that, all right? It will grow and it will work for you. If you're putting it on a true dollar cost average program and you're taking the company match. But this is where the independent investor channel provides a ton of value because a lot of people think that that's all they need to do. If you're not maxing out your 401k at work, you're probably not doing enough, okay? You're not doing enough. So, my, I always contend, look, to, 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 to understand that a self-directed account even exists, most people don't know that they exist. Why is that? It's because they only benefit individuals. I've said this a thousand times. It's worth saying another a thousand times because if you don't know that that exists and it can be an additional layer to your 401k, you can start that account and start it with a minuscule $25. Now, if you have the means and you've got a lump sum of a thousand or 2,500 or 5,000, go ahead and, and, and get that money in there and get it invested. Okay. And depending on the amount that you have in the 401k, let's say it's north of that $10,000 goal, then I would say you're absolutely good to start picking away at some of those good quality dividend paying stocks, maybe even a couple of good growth names in there. Don't hesitate. If you've got that good baseline and you want to buy NVIDIA in your self-directed account, guys, all those growth dollars that you're going to make over time are going to be tax protected and wealth preserved in that. All right. You're going to be sharing in with no one. Okay. You're cutting out the middleman and giving yourself that direct conduit basically to the market. All right. Now, the more single stock that we own in the self-directed account, the more of a participant you become. All right. And a lot of people hear the word investing and they, it scares them. OK, don't think about it as investing. Think about it as being a participant. How many people out there who are on this live feed have an Apple product in their home? Do you want to be a participant in Apple, a $1 trillion company, or do you want to be a non-participant? Okay. It is a cognitive choice to either be a participant or a non-participant in the stock market. And Apple is just one example. Okay. If you love what Home Depot offers and you think their customer service is fantastic and you resonate with their product, Costco, all right, Shell, Exxon, Chevron, okay. If you go to Disney every year and you take the family down there, help you go by yourself, okay, and you resonate with the product, think about investing as a pledge to participate in the successes of those individual companies. And there's no better way to do it than to layer on your 401k with the self-directed account and build yourself that 100% stock portfolio, okay? This is a little bit more advanced in our thinking in the traditional portfolio methods may not, may not allow you to meet your financial goals. Have you ever sat back and thought or asked yourself the question, do I have enough stock in my life? Am I invested in enough stock to give myself even a fighting chance to make my financial goals in the future. And I think for a lot of people, that is a scary question to ask. And if they're honest with themselves, the answer is probably no. All right. So very, very hard questions to ask yourself. And it is never too soon in your life to ask those questions. Rohan, thank you so much. That could be one of the questions of the night, man. I love answering that question because it is so important to understand that just by doing the minimum in a 401k may not be enough. And the self-directed Roth IRA account can be really the tip of that iceberg in your portfolio building and give you that additional exposure uh, to the single stock, the stock market, the dividend reinvestment, and you don't pay, you don't pay anybody 
uh, to have that level of, of exposure, right? The self-directed portion allows you to cut out the middleman. And that is a beautiful thing, all right? When I talk about empowering investors from day one of the Independent Investor Channel, that's exactly what I'm talking about. It is putting you in charge of your own vehicle, all right? A self-directed account, you owe no one it, nothing. You owe no one, okay? You take the risk, yes, and you reap all the reward, all of it, all right? Great question. Thank you. Avi, I've got Doug Whitaker. Crone just seems to be too good to be true. Yeah, I saw some really good articles this week on Kronos. Um, kind of fudging some of their uh, contracts with some of the properties that they're, that they're looking to develop product on. So just, just be careful. All right. I'm not touching it. So, I mean, if you guys value my opinion at all, there, there's, there's hundreds of other stocks. I, I think the industry is extremely attractive. I really do. I think there's going to be a lot of volatility. I think as things start to become a little bit more acknowledged, especially on the medical benefit side of it, um, I, I think there's going to be a lot of money to be made as well. Um, but you guys have to understand that those opportunities in the stock market come and they go every single day. OK, this is not a new thing. All right. And if, if you want to always try to make your money on the newest thing, you're probably going to be disappointed more than just taking my advice and buying boring old Johnson and Johnson. OK, just buy Johnson and Johnson. You'll sleep easy at night. OK, um, I had a question. What do you think of Tesla as a long term growth play? The share price dropped below 300 today. Tesla, Tesla is, 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 is an easy one. Um, it's an easy one for me, okay? And um, I have not invested in Tesla. I won't invest in, in Tesla. I've been watching the stock drop. Um, there's a significant amount of, of um, uh, flux, for a lack of better terms, in the upper echelon. Um, with Elon Musk, I'm not sure what he's waiting for. What, what I'd love to see, and if this did happen, the stock had pop 20%, no doubt, um, if he would just step aside and be the visionary that he is for the company and get a real CEO in there, he, he's not a CEO. He, he would admit that himself. Um, I'm not sure what they're waiting for, but I'm not really sure based on a lot of different um, earnings reports that he has put out um, that I feel like he really cares at all about shareholders. I, I, I don't. I know he's really down on shorts. Um, who buy the stock and, and want to see it go down. Um, but if his loyalty was really to, to have, you know, the, the risk, he's such a responsibility as a publicly traded company to shareholders. And, you know, a good board of directors really should have the, the, the shareholders are the ones that own the company. And um, it's not a stock that I'm interested in buying. I think their product is, is fantastic. I think they have a very loyal following. Um, do I, do I have any, uh, desire to go buy a Tesla tomorrow? No, <laughs> I don't. I, I will keep my, uh, paid off Toyota Tacoma that I have 200,000 miles on. Um, so for all the overindulgent people out there who have the means to go out and buy a Tesla, I, I think the product is fantastic. I really do. And I think in the hands of a good manager or a good CEO, a, a real savvy auto person, um, I, I think the stock will go up. I mean, it could double, you know, um, is there money there to be made? Sure. Sure. There is. Um, is, am, am I going to pledge my dollars to, to play with a, with a company that doesn't make any money? No, I, I just, they're amassing way too much debt. Um, they're having to raise capital way, way too often. And sooner than later, somebody's going to call the BS flag on Tesla. And that's going to be a very, very rude awakening. I could be completely wrong on that. But that's my assessment on Tesla. I, and again, it's in that category of autos that I, I tend to gravitate away from. And airlines is, is not subject to that topic. I've never invested in an airline. Um, I don't believe I have ever invested in an auto company outside of Ferrari. So you want to buy a good company, buy Ferrari instead. I mean, I, I just think, why play, with, why, why play with Tesla right here? There's so many better quality companies out there that are actually making money. So uh, call me crazy. That's one of the major criteria. And I think there's some turmoil going on in Tesla. They were a darling in the stock market for a long time, but they've, they've uh, 
changed flags on being the darling of the stock market a long time ago. It's getting punished right now. So don't try to catch a falling knife. Uh, Tesla might not have seen its bottom at 300 right here, but who's to say it's a very volatile stock. Thank you for the question, Daryl. Very, very genuine question. Uh, can't wait to see your portfolio. Yeah, no, I'm glad to share it with you. Um, again, I'm just feeling my way through the M1 platform. I, I, it's um, a little bit simple. I'm very partial to Merrill Edge. Um, I love the data. I, I love the fact that I can get stack, stock information just by hovering over the stock and boom, it's right there. Um, I don't really like the news feeds that comes through M1. So there's a few things that are, are a little bit um, a little bit annoying. I, I, their customer service was really good. I've been on the phone with them twice. Uh, so for what that means to you guys, if you are looking to get exposed, it's probably my number one recommendation because um, I cannot talk down the services that they offer. The partial shares, the self-directed account and free and free, uh, the ability to buy free, uh, free trades. Um, no other brokerage house is offering that. I mean, I've got to get up to a $50,000 incentive level in mine to get 30 free trades. M1 allows you to, to trade stock for free right away. So it, very cool platform. And I think it would really fit with a lot of people's long-term plans, you know, to start that self-directed account, uh, you know, and, and get a thousand dollars starting amount in there to, to start themselves off on the right foot. Um, so that's why I kind of highly endorse it, but uh, certainly throw all the major other players in there, TD Ameritrade, uh, Fidelity, Charles Schwab, um, Vanguard is okay. I would prefer Merrill Edge, which is the broker that I use. I think they're fantastic. Um, I have no qualms with Merrill Edge. They have never let me down. Very good customer service. So um, do, yeah, just one of those topics that you got to kind of muddle through. It's kind of a pain to get everything started. Um, M1 was very easy to get started. Um, but um, you just one of those decisions that eventually you have to decide on what brokerage and, you know, you can do your research, but I try to help you, you know, um, tailor it down to, to at least my top six for you guys to help out. Um, so watched it go back up a bit today. Yeah. <laughs> Kronos. Yeah. Yeah. I know you missed out on a few dollars there, Doug. I'm sorry. You, you missed out. You only made 60% and not, uh, not 62%. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, man, I, Doug, Doug's the man. I got to meet Doug someday so we can get together and really talk stock, man. He's, he's really something else. I've got Teresa Ford here who threw a question into the group, thinking about dumping my stash, Acorns and Robinhood accounts. Your thoughts? Um, I think it's a good idea. I, I really do. Um, stash and Acorns, if you've got some benefit out of those two platforms, it seems like they're kind of fun to be honest with you. Um, but let's get real. I'm not really, I'm not really a big advocate. I've never done one of my YouTube videos devoted to stash and acorns. It just seems like one of those things. And I'll throw Robin hood into this as well. Robin hood is a legitimate broker. Now with that said, Robin hood has some very specific shortcomings. Uh, that of which I've addressed through my M1 evaluation. And that was ultimately why I went with M1 um, over Robinhood, because there's at least three things that M1 offers that Robinhood does not. And you guys can correct me if you'd like. But my understanding is that Robinhood, when I reviewed, did not offer retirement accounts. Now, I have done videos on my platform when during a time when there was a lot of people jumping on the Robinhood bandwagon because the allure of free trades is just too much for a new investor to look at and say, wow, you know, I can buy an Apple stock or I can buy Pfizer and they're not going to charge me for it. That's good enough. And they fail to recognize, and this may be your case as well, is that you kind of put the horse before the carriage and you start that Robin Hood account looking to save that $7 trading fee as opposed to looking at the tax benefits of a retirement account, you know, especially a self-directed account where you may incur some of those trading fees, all right, but the tax benefits over the long term are going to far outweigh anything that you could get in a Robin Hood account. Um, so it, it's, it's, I, would, I would highly recommend if you don't have, depending on your age, your risk tolerance, 
uh, certainly can't imply that, you know, I, I know any of those things, but where your financial goals are in the future, very, very important, those three things. But if you had a 401k, for example, um, and you wanted to start the self-directed account, I would recommend that you look at the brokers that I recommend, Merrill Edge, Fidelity, TD Ameritrade, M1 Finance, that will work for you. Of course, Vanguard is always in the discussion as a premier broker. We, we don't tend to talk about a lot of second tier brokers. I, we don't need to do that on the Independent Investor Channel. That's why when I'm talking about the S&P 500, for example, I typically don't stray too far away from products that are offered by Vanguard, okay? And if you start a brokerage account with Fidelity, for example, you can buy all the products from Vanguard that you want, um, uh, minus their Admiral shares that are only offered through their platform. But um, I tend to not really gravitate toward indexed investing. Um, I really like the benefits of ETF investing to start. Um, and, and if you have a nice diversified base in an ETF, then you can start to just buy single stock. Okay. And there's not a stock that I offer through the independent investor channel. At least I would challenge you uh, to try to pick a stock that I've ever recommended through the history and chronicle of the channel that you haven't heard about. Okay. We talk Home Depot. We talk about Disney, Pfizer, Merck. Um, we talk about big blue chip companies, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup, um, you know, names like that. And uh, every now and then we'll throw out one that I, I've identified um, that's got a really, really good business, got a very, I, I tend to deal with companies that are well in excess of $10 billion, I, anything less than $10 billion. I'm not, I'm not really that interested. As a matter of fact, I, I'm more interested in the companies that are pushing 50, $100 billion of market cap. I, I'm not really that interested in investing a lot of my money into high growth stuff. And at the end of the day, I sleep fine knowing that I'm making a good 4% dividend on a Pfizer. You know, I, I can invest in a Comcast at 175 billion market cap. The, those are the companies that I resonate with. And, um, but uh, I, I, I would dump them if you've made some money there, which you probably have. Um, you, you could dump them. Unfortunately, with the Robin Hood, you don't have a lot of latitude to move. If you have not um, owned those assets in the Robin Hood account for more than a year, um, you're going to be subject to some short-term capital gains tax. If you have owned them for over a year, um, you may have some tax shelter there based on your income. So um, certainly want to understand the tax implication. I'm not a tax accountant, okay? Uh, I'm supposed to portray an entertainer on YouTube, um, but I do know what I'm talking about, and that could subject you there to some tax um, on the liquidation of the Robinhood account. But if, if you're young enough, it, it could very well um, mean the difference into getting you into the correct vehicle. Um, and I wouldn't do YouTube. I wouldn't do the independent investor channel. If I wasn't 100% steadfast in my message that the self-directed account offered through any of the brokerage houses that I just offered to you um, is golden information. It just doesn't get any better than that. It just doesn't. And I, I do challenge you to go out there and talk to friends, family, anybody out there who's ever heard of a self-directed account. I think you're going to be surprised at what you hear and that the majority of people have never even heard of that option. All right. And it is the best option. All right. Teresa, thank you for that question. I hope I answered it. It was a really good question. I get it all the time. I just think a lot of people out there opted for Robin Hood at the expense of a good retirement account. All right. So easily fixed. Go ahead and take some of those profits now at the with the market at an all time high. Um, you could definitely look at look at liquidating some positions, moving on, using some of those funds to actually fund a real retirement account, especially a self directed Roth IRA account. And once you get those started and you get the account funded, uh, certainly do not hesitate to hit me up through the Facebook group if you're a, a member. Um, and we'll get that portfolio built out for you. There's very few assets that I recommend. And uh, most of those assets come right off of the Vanguard site when we're looking at building a nice ETF portfolio or, of course, a blue chip portfolio. It's, it's very simple. That's the fun part of investing um, is actually building the portfolio, getting people to acknowledge where you're looking to go. That's the hard part. The, the hard part is getting people to take that leap of faith and get the account started and get it funded up. That's the hard part. All right. And it will continue to be the hard part. All right. 
Um, let me scroll back up here. Mike D threw a tip in here. Thanks, guys. I, I really appreciate that. That really helps supplement the channel. Um, I'm still waiting to pay back my initial investment, but uh, decided to do the M1 account to kind of start the money machine anyway. So uh, Bank of America. Yeah, I do love. I got Benjamin Levy throwing that out there in the community. I do. I think Bank of America is a, is a premier financial company. I just don't understand what's going on right now. Um, financials can't get out of their own way. Um, the, the premier financial companies that I'm, I'm a big advocate of are JP Morgan. Um, Bank of America is one of them. I've liquidated my position in Wells Fargo. Um, uh, Citigroup, as a lot of you guys know, um, you know, if you had a nice position that maybe you wanted to take and then Berkshire Hathaway, maybe some uh, B, Class B shares in Berkshire, um, I would recommend going with that. Goldman Sachs is another one of those big ones you can't go wrong with. Um, but um, that, that's kind of it for your financials. And they're out of favor right now, um, which is typically a good time to actually look like adding some exposure to them. So I've got a pretty good position in uh, JP Morgan right now, a small position in Citigroup. Uh, and that's about it. You guys know that I had Blackstone Group. I had that run up. I took a little bit of profit, still kept some shares in Blackstone Group. Uh, but uh, like I said, I, I made a strong move this week to kind of shore up some uh, cash position in my portfolio in acknowledgement to some of the headwinds I see right around the corner. So uh, just kind of take my advice, guys. It doesn't mean that to come Tuesday, you have to sell everything in your portfolio. But I absolutely always want to want you to keep in, in the back of your mind you know, the position, the position thinking, right. And, and the defensive positioning, the, what if always ask yourself, what if, what if the market corrects 20%, am I going to be okay to add more position to it or weather the downturn? All right. And this is what a lot of people on YouTube do not talk about. They don't. And I just, I love you guys. I, I don't know hardly any of you guys, but I don't want to be responsible for offering investment you know, advice to get involved and expose yourself to the stock market without understanding that it is a double-sided game. It's a two-sided game. It's a double-edged sword, okay? Whatever, whatever you have to do to, to, to listen to what I'm saying about acknowledging that now is the time that you want to look at the stock market and say, okay, I've got some appreciation here. I'm happy with it. I want to keep my positions. I want to diversify my position. Whatever makes sense to you, do not get complacent on the stock market, all right? Always be building for the scenario of if the stock market continues up, I'm okay. And if the if the stock market, for whatever reason, on, on Tuesday takes a 20 or 30% hiccup, or over the next couple months, it starts to, to come down, um, I, I'm starting to sense that it's going to start coming down. That's just my feeling, okay? It means nothing. It means nothing other than I don't mind putting it out there because I was willing to act on my feeling this week. And that's exactly what I did on Wednesday. And I don't mind sharing that with you guys. All right. It would be a heck of a lot more sexy if I would just come on here and said, yep, I'm throwing, you know, $128,000 at this stock market and everybody would be like, wow, all right, you're a stock God. You must be amazing. I, I think that's extremely irresponsible at this point. I think it's extremely irresponsible. And I, and I just hope um, for the people who are doing that now, um, they don't learn the hard way, okay? Because when the stock market drops, it drops fast and it drops hard. And I'm sorry to be offering this information to you. I know it's kind of a wet towel, but even I need to hear this information every now and then because I sometimes get caught up in the, wow, this is interesting, but uh, I do have enough maturity to look at the stock market with two different lenses. Okay. And that's what I'm trying to kind of teach you guys is to look at the stock market as a vehicle. All right. Um, if you've made some easy money on, on some of the stocks, like, you know, Doug has pointed out this evening that he's done. Um, I give you all the credit in the world. I just had some family member hit me up with the question, is it time to take profits? And I was like, you're up 50%. Like, what are you doing? Are you, are you, do you want to marry the stock? Or are you happy that you're up 50%? How would you feel if it, if it went down and you lost it all and you didn't pull the trigger? Okay. So don't underestimate the power of selling stock when it makes sense for you. Okay. And it's not something you ever have to do with emotion. Okay. 
Um, but if you if you've taken a nice appreciation ride in the stock market, and I'm hoping some of the guys in the community as well. I know I've got Brent in here, um, who's probably a little bit more technically savvy than I am, um, and then Ernest, who probably blows me out of the water with technicals. Um, I asked for his assistance as well, and I think he'll probably take this topic and further the discussion in the Facebook group. At least I would hope that he does because it's one of those topics that I believe if we're not talking about it now, I really think we're doing ourselves a, a disservice by not offering it to somebody who's just maybe started in the stock market over the last year or two and has made a little bit of money and thinks that that's all that it's about. And we're, we're, we're not winning the war at all. We may be winning a battle, but we're not winning the war in our own personal finances if we're not utilizing this opportunity to perhaps scale back some of our exposure, okay? So thank you for that. Um, do you have those 10 companies in your M1 at an equal amount of 10%? I got to suggest everyone invest in JD. It will be a multi-bagger and it's an incredible investment. It is going to be a multi-bagger and it is going to have incredible movement. Um, I believe I've got JD set at about 6 or 7%. I wanted to take a little bit higher of a bite out of Amazon. Amazon runs at the highest percentage at around 18%, and I've got uh, Salesforce at about 15%, and then it kind of scales down to about 10% on average, uh, 10, 12%. I've got NVIDIA somewhere around the middle there. Um, Netflix, I've kind of got there in the middle at 10, 12%. I don't remember the exact numbers. You guys will see that when I make the video, um, but they are not equally weighted. Um, they are they are balanced in accordance with the percentage that I awarded to each of the holdings that I wanted to see in that portfolio. I didn't need to have it balanced, um, but I do agree with you on the JD.com for sure. It's pretty awesome. Uh, VOO and VTI are recommended. VOO for US 500 big. Uh, yep, the S&P 500 cap stocks and VTI for a mix of international ones. Thank you, Brent, for that. I think you're probably re reliant, uh, replying to somebody. Um, I've got just a ton of questions in here, guys. So I'm going to try to work through. If I miss you, um, I completely apologize for that. If you did ask a question and you did not got, get it answered on this, please do not hesitate to carry your question over into the Facebook group. And I've got a lot. I've got a, a lot of opinions in there that should be hitting those up as well to give you guys a, a, an array of opinions uh, to help you get your questions answered. Um, I'm going to scroll through here and see what we've got here. Uh, no problem. I just started a self-managed Roth IRA because of you. Best decision ever. Uh, Teresa hit me up with that earlier on in this discussion. I just came across her question and I, I wanted to address it. Um, it was the best decision I ever made as well. And honestly, that, that, that right there is the core and the heart of the Independent Investor Channel. And, and I hope that you guys are sharing this with people who will listen to you. You're, you're going to have people who don't listen to you, okay? Um, it, it's one of those things to where uh, you, you have to know in your heart that it's the right thing. And, and um, I'm one of those guys that can't – I don't like to sell people things. I, I hate it. I, I don't – I used to do a job where I had to cold, cold call people. Have you guys ever done that before? Um, and it's the most uncomfortable feeling for me. I hate it. So for me to be on YouTube and talking about something, it has to be something that I do. It has to be something that I can basically share, okay? I'm not looking to sell anybody anything, all right? However, I do acknowledge that this information is priceless. And it can mean the difference between hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I don't throw those figures out there lightly. I've done videos where I've backed it up mathematically. It's just... It's just the comparison between a self-directed account and a managed account. Anybody can look at that comparison and see for their own eyes. And when they do see it, it's liberating. And that's how it was for me. And I'm really glad to that. I mean, that right there is really the fuel that uh, that fuels my fire um, on the Independent Investor Channel, knowing that I turned somebody on to what, in my opinion, is the absolute best financial avenue that you can take for yourself. You never, ever have to answer to anybody again in your life with regard to your finances. And you've always said, heard that the, the best person to trust is yourself with your money. The Independent Investor Channel allows you to do just that. And that is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Whenever you start trusting others with your money, 
you're going to be sorely disappointed. And this cuts all that fat out of the equation. And I love that about the message that we put through. Thank you for that revalidation, Teresa. I really appreciate it. Um, what broker do you guys are talking to each other? Got four grand right now. Good to see you, Brent. Benjamin Levy, you're moving up in the world, man. Uh, I, I uh, would like to see you do a compounding video um, for your group and show them your portfolio there as an example. And I want you to run the, the uh, compounding uh, calculator out. And if you really want a piece of advice from me, and I, and I don't mean to sound this condescending, um, but I didn't find out about the compounding calculator that takes into consideration the expense in a, an investment account, whether it be one or 3% on the higher side, um, I'd like you to run that portfolio out and compare the two at 4,000 right now at your age until you reach retirement. You're, you're going to blow some of those young viewers that you have there away in comparing what it is in a managed account and what it is in a self-directed account. You're going to blow them away. It's going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars of difference. All right. So I, I would love to see that, man. I will come over and comment. You hit me up and tell me you made that. I will come over and, and, and comment for you. Um, and it, the young people have to hear that, man. And you're the one that resonates with that message. That A lot of young kids don't want to listen to an old, older fogey like me talk about finances. They just think it's boring and they turn me off, which is, which is fine too. But uh, uh, they, they tend to resonate with the younger crowd and, and you're one of them, man. So sorry, sorry to bestow that responsibility upon you. Um, but a lot, a lot of kids, man, want to listen to younger savvy investors who are interested in getting started uh, early. And I, I applaud you and I support you 100 percent. Great time to get in on China. Uh, once $200 billion tariffs officially announced, China closed to historic lows with some amazing companies. JD has bigger plans uh, that will be realized soon. Um, China Mobile is moving up. JD.com, I have exposure to, obviously, Alibaba as well. The China market as a whole, um, the German market as well is a good buy right here. Um, everybody's kind of taking it on the chin with this. Um, one thing about our current president, he certainly doesn't mind mixing it up right now, which um, I've been hurting my portfolio um, and I've also gained a ton from that shakeup as well. So that's about all I'll say about that. I don't want to dive into politics on the Independent Investor channel. Um, however, it's been an interesting two years to say the least, and I'll leave it at that. Um, totally agree with the defensive approach. I've been building cash reserves in a money market account, always looking to add to my blue chip portfolio. How do you feel about Boeing? Uh, Boeing is one of my favorite companies. It's one of my favorite industrials. Um, if I could buy Boeing, FedEx, Whirlpool um, is another one of my favorites. I like UPS. Um, but uh, yeah, those big blue chip companies. I like Clorox as well, um, which I don't own any of those that I just mentioned, but um, Boeing is best of breed. So um, it's one of those companies that if, you, if, you're, if you've got a, a nice sizable amount built up and you want to take a stab at Boeing, um, I endorse that. Okay. I'm always a best of breed and I know I'm borrowing from Jim Cramer, uh, but what works works. Okay. You always want to be looking at the best of breed in any category. I don't care if you're looking at biotech. I don't care what sector you're looking at. Why go to a third or fourth or fifth tier recommendation if you can just buy the best? Okay. And there's other airplane manufacturers out there. Okay. But Boeing is the best and I endorse that move. Um, I don't currently own Boeing. Um, I kind of took it on the chin with a quick trading position I took on Boeing and um, I kind of I kind of missed out a little bit on that, but um, the industrials that I own right now are UTX, United Technologies, and 3M companies, um, and I think that's about it for oh, and General Electric, um, which I kind of forgot about, but uh, um, it's there, it's there, and it's the industrial sector. Um, I've got Teresa who hit me up with another question, very good question. I could make an entire video on this. What ETFs do you recommend? Um, for you, it's very much going to be beneficial for you to go to what I consider the ETF shopping mall, and that is going to be Vanguard's website. Okay. And I have the link in my Facebook group. Um, if anybody can throw the link into the, uh, community discussion here, that would help Teresa. 
Um, but just as simple as going to Vanguard.com and going to their listing of ETFs, <clears throat> excuse me. And what you're going to find is their listing of bond ETFs at the top. And what you want to do is go down to their stock uh, ETFs. If you go too far down, you're going to get into sector specific ETFs. What that means is you're going to have a technology ETF and you're going to have a healthcare ETF. You're going to have a utilities ETF. I would recommend staying away from those sector specific ETFs and looking at just your large cap ETFs. I recommend VTI, VOO, MGK, VO is your mid cap. Uh, VB is your small caps, okay? The majority of your weighting in your portfolio could be in the S&P 500, which is VOO. It is their flagship ETF. It has the lowest expense ratio of 0 0.04. And you can get on there and you can validate all this information for yourself. Don't think that you have to catch everything that comes out of my mouth um, all at once because it's tough, all right? But it will benefit you immensely if you save the Vanguard's link in your favorites on your computer and you at your leisure can go into that Vanguard mall or marketplace, whatever you want to call it, and basically pick your ETFs off that list. Why Vanguard? Vanguard, you'll find in the research tab is in the is 90% cheaper than any other of its peer group ETFs offered that is similar in nature. And each individual ETF will give you those statistics about what they're invested in, what comparatively speaking, how their fees stack up, which 0 0.04, I wouldn't recommend it on the independent investor channel if, if I didn't feel like you could go buy it tomorrow, okay? Um, these are ETFs that I have owned. Um, these are ETFs that I don't mind recommending to my core subscriber group uh, for folks that have started the Roth IRA, the self-directed Roth IRA, and is looking to fund with those products. And you don't need to look really much further um, than that ETF website. They've got some very intriguing products out there. They've got some large cap growth ETFs. They've got some mega cap growth. They've got a dividend payer in the VYM all right, which is another very good, safe, diversified ETF that's going to get you really, really good exposure for less than a tenth of a basis point. It just doesn't get any better than that. So that's why I don't recommend every ETF. It's just going to confuse people. I would rather just drop you into one recommended website, and that way you can buy all of your financial products off of there. The ironic part about it is you can get into the VOO and you can see what their top 10 holdings are, okay? And it's going to be weighted to the highest market cap in the S&P 500, which is starting with Apple computers, and it's going to work its way back. That can give you some really good investment ideas if you wanted some single stock exposure as well. You're going to see names like Wells Fargo, Visa, Apple. Amazon, Google, Facebook, which are which are good, higher growth, right? See, but got to be kind of careful. You're going to see names like Procter and Gamble, Johnson and Johnson, some of those discretionary and staples names as well. Uh, so you can get on there and really you can find everything and more that you could ever want to buy in a portfolio, and that's kind of a one stop shop for you. Okay, very good question. Thank you for an, uh, asking. That's a good one. A lot of people need to hear that. I've got Mike D right below you. I finally made it to the live chat. Oh, yeah, I've already touched on that. That's cool. Welcome to you. Um, I'm just kind of scanning through some of these to make sure I hit. Sometimes this jumps around, so it's kind of hard to follow. If somebody has less than $25,000, would not you risk getting your account froze if you're in and out? Um, Miles Jenkins asks a pretty good question. And this is kind of where we talk about the relativity in the stock market. If you've got 25,000 in the stock market, um, I'm not really sure about what you mean by, by 25,000 if your account will get froze. Um, you'll get a free loading uh, violation from the SEC if you're trading like daily, okay? Make no mistake, freeing up some cash um, does not mean that I'm advocating for trading so frequently that you get hit with free writing 
restrictions in your account. Okay. That's not what we're talking about. I don't advocate for day trading on the independent investor channel. Um, I, I do take short term trades in stock. Um, and I, and I do make money on those that that's fine. But as far as like quitting my day job to become a Gordon Gecko, that's not something that I recommend. And that's not something that I advocate for. I acknowledge that the majority of my audiences are fairly younger uh, investors who are looking to take such a leap from not knowing a whole lot about the stock market, not investing one single dime in the stock market to the prospect of taking my advice, starting an account that none of their friends have, that of which they've never heard of, taking the leap of faith and putting some good diversified assets in that. If I can get people to resonate with that idea right there, I definitely don't want to turn them off to the stock market in talking about you know, the frequency of trading in the account and all that stuff. But I think your question is a really good one. And I don't want to give the wrong impression that somebody who's, let's say, invested $1,000 you know, a year ago, and maybe they're up to 1500. Okay, maybe they're up, you know, uh, you know, a, a certain percentage in their portfolio, you know, they're up 33%, or they're up 40 or 50% even, you know, to say that at that at that level of monetary exposure to the stock market, that you couldn't just allow that to ride. Okay, the, the, the profit, the, the, the money that I've shored up this week, you guys have to understand that I have a pretty big exposure to the stock market and it just seemed prudent to me to kind of take some of those profits off of the table and safeguard them into cash. Right, wrong or indifferent, that's the decision that I made, but that's actually what I'm talking about. And 25,000, depending on the position power that you have in that portfolio, depending on the investments that you have, depending on the amount of cash that you have, depending on your debt acknowledgement, depending on other investment accounts that you have, that all those things would determine what I would look at if that 25,000 was completely 100% exposed to equities right now. Okay. So it's a little bit deeper than, than timing the market. Okay. Because that's the question that I get hit with all the time. Ryan, shouldn't I sell all my stock right now to avoid the eventual downturn? And isn't it better to buy the stock market when it's down? It's so much easier saying that it's close to impossible to do. It is close to impossible. So take my advice. D don't try to do that. Okay. All you can try to do is safeguard some cash when you feel like the market is at an all time high. And it is. It's fair to acknowledge that. And it's fair to acknowledge that the, that, that the stock market could continue north. Okay. There's always that possibility. But how much upside do you guys honestly think we have in this stock market as opposed to with the eventual headwinds right around the corner that we couldn't have a nice correction or even enter into a potential recession within the next two, three, four or five years? Do I t intend on keeping my cash on the sideline all that time? No, I don't. Um, but I'm hoping for a shorter term correction, that of which I can redeploy some of those um, uh, cash right now that I've safeguarded uh, to the stock market. Okay. So that, that's just kind of what the discussion that we're fostering this evening uh, in the group. And it's definitely worth having right now while you have the convenience of working in a record high stock market. Okay. Um, I have stocks that I purchased for long-term dividends recently. I plan on holding them for 25 years minimum. Are you suggesting I sell these now and try to time a re-entry point later? I hope I just addressed that. No, I'm not. Um, I've got Omston at one who's in it. This is a very good question. If you're looking at building your portfolio and you've got around five to $10,000 in the stock market, I want you guys to stay invested for the long term. Okay, that is prudent advice. But when you guys have, you have to understand that I'm giving you guys some insight to say, look, I've paired my equities exposure back to 60%. That still means that I've got around $160,000 exposed to the stock market, okay? So it's, it's relative advice, okay? And it has to be specific to the person that I'm speaking with. And the, 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 the idea of defensive positioning is relative to someone who has 1,500 
in their account or someone like me who's got 300,000 in the account, right? It's relative to acknowledge how important defensive positioning is. Does that mean that the person with 1,500 or 10,000 or 25 or even 50,000 has to act? Of course not. It doesn't mean that. We only bring it up in sake of discussion to say, hey, Ryan mentioned the, the prospect of defensive positioning. I need to look at my portfolio. Am I good with it? Absolutely. What could I do? Now, if you look at your portfolio and you say, I've got $25,000, I'm letting it ride. I'm good. I'm long on my stocks for the next 25 years. I'm good. But maybe there's one little thing over here that because we started that discussion that you look at and you're like, wow, Ryan did mention that I could actually save a little bit more cash on the side. Maybe you start to save that cash, right? By nature of having this discussion, all right, now we're now we're winning. All right. Now that's a savvy financial discussion that's worth having and it's worth acting upon. That's an awesome question. I hope I answered that. No, I don't want you to sell things on Tuesday. I just want you to ask those scary questions because seemingly no one else on YouTube wants to push out credible information about approaching the stock market and acknowledging that in its history, it's gone down 45 times. Okay. Each one of those 45 different times where the market has corrected, it has proven each and every time to be a wonderful buying opportunity. If you're a hundred percent invested in the stock market and you have zero cash put aside to take advantage of those downturns, you are going to be ill prepared because you didn't ask those scary questions that I posed to the group this evening. All right. I sold all of my mutual funds and the money I get from that. I will pay 50% to VOO and plan to hold it for the long term. Smart move. Mike, good move. Um, depending on the amount of liquidation that you got from the mutual funds. Um, and I'd like to know, I don't know if I've spoken with you before on the expenses that you sold out of, but I can guarantee your expense ratio is much more than VOO. I would recommend, depending on the amount there that was liquidated, being careful with uh, buying the S and P 500 right here. Definitely want to take, you know, take that capital. Depending on what amount we're talking about, if we're talking about less than ten thousand dollars, I think you're okay. Go ahead and put that exposure in there. The reason why I recommend that is not because your money is less important than someone with more money. It's just the fact that you're exposing less money to the stock market and you need to have that money exposed at, at that lesser of amount um, right now, immediately. Okay, Getting that money invested is top priority. All right. A, a 20 or 30 percent um, decline in the stock market with $10,000 is two or 3,000. If you've got $100,000, you're talking about 20 or $30,000. Okay. So that, that's the relativity that I kind of talk about to where I'm a little more apt to say, you know, if you're less than that $10,000 marker, go ahead and invest aggressively, no matter what the market does, it doesn't matter. Okay. But if you do have, you know, 50, 100, 250, 500,000, why not take a little bit of skin out of the game continue to dollar cost average the stock market, but some of those profits kind of put on the side. So excellent discussion this evening, guys. Uh, been going for an hour and 20 minutes tonight as usual. I, I really appreciate, um, we've held true on this group tonight. It's been a very devoted group. I thank you guys who have made monetary compensation to the channel. Um, that all goes to a, a, a good cause. It doesn't go to me. Um, I'm, I'm actually funneling that money into the M1 account. Um, and we'll look to do some good things um, later on in life with it if it builds to something significant. I, I don't really care about the money. I do this um, because I love doing it. and It's an infinite topic. I, I love that. So um, depends on invested amount, uh, obstinate. If it's 10,000 or less, Brent's saying the same thing I did, hopefully. And that, that he's, he's got the same mindset as I do. I believe it's just, it, it comes with it a little bit more experience. If you had 500 or even a million dollars exposed to this market, um, I would think twice about just writing this through with that much capital in the stock market guys. It wasn't very long ago where people in 2008, 2009, lost half of their pension. Okay. And there was a lot of people that did panic on that because they were sitting on that $1 million. 
um, and, 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 and just kept it in there. Okay. Now the smart ones kept it writing, but a lot of people didn't have that type of time to justify waiting through to get $600,000 back after the stock market paired back 50, 60%. Okay. A lot of people panicked and they got out. Why not, why not take some of that and put it aside? You only live once. Um, and and I've, I'm a little bit more aggressive on safeguarding cash. I'm not looking to play with the stock market. No way. All right. And I do have some deeper reasons as to why I approach the stock market in this manner. I think inflation uh, is one of those keys. I think the amount of, of, of money that we're making has a lot to do with that as well. So I'm looking to get while the getting's good, but um, I'm, not, I'm not looking to be 100% exposed um, in the future when an eventual downturn does hit. Okay. And I hope that resonates with you guys. Just finished entering my positions for Canada Financials, RY, BNS, BMO, TD, and CM. That is awesome. I know I have a lot of folks from uh, Canada who join the group here, um, and I, I love it. Anything that we can say, I know the programs are a little bit different. I definitely have some folks from some European countries that tune into the live feed after we offer it. And I know their availability to some of the retirement accounts are drastically different uh, and if not um, unavailable. All right. And I know Canada does have something similar to what the U.S. has um, in way of a Roth IRA. So um, offering those picks through the group really helps out a lot because I, I know I've got uh, quite a few um, folks join in the live feed here from Canada. So I thank you for that. Um, I'm going to try to get to the end of these questions. I'm pretty sure I've hit most of them. Um, I've got obstinate one here as well. I just started a Roth. I maxed out my first year contribution. So yes, it is under 10. Uh, yeah. So um, I, I will applaud you. First of all, um, half of the people in the United States have less than a thousand dollars in their savings account. You've probably pushed yourself into the top 90th percentile of people who have around $10,000 of invested capital. And it's it's amazing how many people cannot meet that financial threshold in life. So I give you all the credit in the world. Um, certainly stay vested. Okay, I did. I weathered those downturns, having had the capital that you're talking about through those downturns. Um, and I, I weathered the downturns. I, I didn't try to safeguard money. I, I I didn't have a lot of money put aside, which I could have. If somebody were of, like me had been sitting across from me and gave me that advice when I went through the downturn of 2008, 2009, and I went through the downturn that was caused by Brexit, um, I, I would have been a, a little bit more prepared to take advantage of those downturns. Guys, I don't fear a downturn in the stock market. I would love to see a downturn in the stock market, all right, because that's the very opportunity that I'm looking to take advantage of. And I've been preparing for that opportunity for years. All right. This move this week was just another step in preparing for what I foresee to be an eventual downturn in the market. And I'm patient enough with regard to stock investing to wait for that opportunity while the rest of my capital works for me. It's a win-win situation. And the quicker you guys can kind of come up to speed and understand how I approach this win-win philosophy in the stock market, the better off you're going to be and the less chance you're going to have of overexposing yourself to the stock market and, and kind of leaving yourself with your pants down when it does take a 20 or 30% haircut and you don't have the investment capital that you wish that you could have um, to kind of take advantage of those dips. Because trust me, when the recession does come or an eventual correction, the same Ryan is going to come on the independent investor and I'm going to talk exactly the way I'm talking to you now. Um, but my recommendations are going to be that much more aggressive the further south the stock market gets and our philosophy will switch as appropriate as we start to move down into bear market territory and we start to become a little bit more optimistic with our program, okay? I would just write it out, losing 30% on 10K is only 3K. That, that's exactly right. Brent, thank you so much for, for address on that. That's exactly correct. That's kind of the way I feel 
Um, you know, $100,000 of capital with other cash reserves, also a 3% can be stomached, but that's 30 grand. And I, I work hard for my money, okay? I know a lot of folks out there that, that money comes really easy. And that's another impression that I got by watching Jeremy's $128,700, $758 portfolio is that he said that he had invested that money just over the last six months. So basically he's taken a bunch of money. I hope he's paid tax on that money because it's earnings, number one. And he's pushed $128,000 into a brokerage account. None of it's tax protected. None of it. Based on his earnings, if he liquidates any of that, he's not protected from long-term capital gains. I just think he's setting himself up for a really tough, rude awakening. And I question his judgment in that he should have already learned his lesson the first time. Okay. Um, I mainly purchase dividend paying stocks that I plan on holding for life and getting letting compounds to start. Very wise, very wise decision. Um, you can really affect the compounding effect on the stocks if you just don't let them go or add more when they end up going down. Uh, I max out with my Vanguard Roth IRA, 10,800. Hector, that's awesome. You got, you've got a killer start. Uh, I just want to reemphasize, man, I try to speak to individuals that are part of this group. Um, that 10,800, I want to make sure that the maximum amount of that is in a self-directed account. If it's with Vanguard, it, it absolutely probably is. Um, I'd be interested to know what your holdings are. I know you're in the Facebook group. Um, I and if you if you kick me over those holdings, I'd be interested to know if you've got the Admiral shares there, or if you just got some ETFs or even some investor shares uh, of their index funds. So uh, you got a killer start, man. You got a killer start, and I I applaud you. That's awesome. Keep it going. Keep dollar cost averaging it. Keep the pressure on. Keep saving that cash for a rainy day. Keep working your finances, man. It has to be worked like anything else worth having in life. You have to work it. You have to work it. All right. Plus Apple pays a dividend. Yeah, Apple does. Um, I've got Les Gibson on the line. One of my good friends. Hey, Ryan, doing my Friday night thing. Both Rose and my M1 accounts are doing phenomenal. Uh, thanks to you. Stay frosty. Yeah, thanks a lot, man, Mr. Arizona. That's real nice. Go play some golf. All right. Make sure you tell Rose hi for me, please. Thank you for that. Um, very, very simple. We just kind of put a, a couple of, um, a couple of pieces together. Um, I want you and Rose definitely to hear my message out tonight. I, hopefully you guys are watching me on the TV. Um, but, but I want you to hear my message about defensive positioning. I really do. Um, you know, I, I know we've got you into some really good blue chip companies. Um, but definitely keep trying to be defensive. Don't put any more money to work if you can't do that um, on the investing side of it. If you can continue to save some cash on the side, um, that, that's great. But I know the portfolio is doing good. I keep tabs on what I recommended to you. So, And uh, I, I don't make those recommendations lightly. I do not. But you do not ever want to lose sight of, over the fact that you and her will be the sole beneficiaries of any money and accumulation of wealth that you have in the stock market, and you will share it with no one. And that is a beautiful thing. It's a liberating thing. And um, I, I was glad to help. What little bit of advice I gave you to help you, I was glad to do it. I, I, I'm, I'm very happy for you guys. Um, <clears throat> and my Roth IRA is all Apple. That's <laughs> smart. <laughs> that position is over 10,000 now, but not selling it as I see their services growing. Services is the biggest thing to owning Apple right now. Um, it's not the iPhone. Um, and Brent's probably taken a very staunch, smart position on Apple. Um, and I, I respect that. I really do. Um, I took my $12,000 position. Excuse me. I've taken, I've taken my bigger position down to 58 shares. Um, and I just... I just parlayed 30 shares um, of Apple. I'm actually down to 18 shares currently um, in Apple with some partial shares in there as well. Um, I actually am taking a little bit of stab and profit sharing right here um, with Apple. That's the choice I made. Um, and I'm starting to accumulate new shares in the M1 account with Apple as it's one of my 10 um, uh, stocks that I wanted to own long-term in the, uh, M1 account. So I am kind of starting to lose my voice a little bit. I've been talking now for about an hour and a half. I want to keep this somewhat 
under control for folks that catch it later on? Um, can I self-direct my own uh, 401k through my employer? I don't believe so. There's a Roth 401k, but I don't believe I've ever heard of a self-directed uh, 401k. They usually kind of restrict your capability in that. So you want to basically pick the best that they have to offer, know what your dollars are going into, and definitely take advantage of the matching program with your employer. It's very, very important. If you want control over an account, let that 401k ride and then start your self-directed Roth IRA on top of your 401k. That's the best advice I can give you. Uh, Buffett is stockpiling Apple. I think he probably knows what he's doing. No doubt. Um, I, I agree with that. That's big time. I, Warren Buffett's just awesome. Um, and uh, he's not the only one stockpiling Apple stock. Actually, right now, BlackRock owns a significant portion as well as some of the other institutional um, buyers own a lot of the stock that are publicly traded. Um, it, it is it is my number one stock to own forever. So I mean, that's how how high of regard um, I hold Apple. It's just that um, you know I was a stock investor in Apple back when it was at ninety two dollars. Um, I, I I've owned it this whole time. Um, so I thought it prudent to take some uh, to take some profit in the in the stock. And you can never fault somebody, even out of a good company like Apple, uh, for taking some profit and safeguarding some of that money to deploy. Um, at a more opportune time. And I will definitely find that opportune time. I'm pretty aggressive on it. Tesla is speculation. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself. Now I'm going to start to kind of close out this group. I'm at kind of the end here. I've got a low ass state of mind. I would definitely want to uh, reach out here. k 97s got check out cannabis stock. Believe ticker uh, BLEVF. Uh, it is almost unheard of for a company that already has its license and is selling at a dollar. Wow, nice. Um, awesome. Love those recommendations to come in the group. I will check that after. Uh, thanks, financial investor. Absolutely. Brent, thank you again for making your way in here. Um, you're really helping keeping the dialogue going. It's almost too much for me to do, and I appreciate your assistance. I also appreciate Benjamin Levy as well kicking into the group. Uh, I hope he follows my advice and does. He's probably working on that video right now. He's pretty aggressive um, on the compounding of this four thousand dollar portfolio. I want to see what he's gonna when he's gonna have at fifty nine and a half. Um, so I told him I'd go comment, and I'm a man of my word. I'd do that. So uh, Teresa Robinhood is great if you're all for holding stocks for a long time. Yeah, definitely. If you uh, use Robinhood uh, as a brokerage account and you want to hold them long term, you can definitely use it. Um, especially if you have money for next year's IRA already and have extra money to invest. That's excellent advice. Got baby cakes there, giving some advice there to Teresa. That's, that, that is absolutely true. I just think a lot of people put the horse before the carriage and they get that relationship um, backwards. They start the Robin Hood before the uh, retirement account. Uh, so really killer. Regarding the Roth IRA, once I have acquired those five, uh, just a second, jumped on me again, guys. Um, <clears throat> where's the Aloha state of mind again? I'm sorry. I lost it. Sometimes this just jumps right out from under me and I got to find it again. Uh, get it. Wow. This is a heck of a heck of a thread here, guys. We've built a very, very nice scratching my head thinking about Vodafone. <laughs> wow. Um, I, you guys are going to have to take some of these questions, uh, across over into the Facebook group for me, if you don't mind. Um, but I'm going to wrap it up here with the Aloha state of mind. Um, you just kind of joined the group a little bit late, but I do want to address this question. Very, very um, loyal subscriber regarding Roth IRA. Once I have acquired those five or six solid stocks, should I just focus on continuing to buy more shares in those stocks going forward? Yeah, you can for a while, but don't don't underestimate. You know, five or six stocks is only going to cover you know, a few sectors and there may be multiple technology stocks that you want to buy. Okay. And I know technology gives you, I always recommend 20% in technology. You, you may want to buy, you know, four or five stocks in technology. You don't have to really write a rule um, to, to stay with five or six stocks. If there's multiple discretionary names that you want or industrial names that you want, don't hold yourself to that. I always just recommend that people don't go out and try to buy the entire stock market all at the same time. Okay. 
So start with five or six, absolutely. Set them up for dollar cost averaging, set them up for dividend reinvestment, but don't ever hesitate to add. I mean, I've probably got 10 or so names in each of my Roths. So that's about right with the money that I've got in there. Um, but look, we're, we're portfolio building. Always put yourself in a position to build upon the decisions that you've made the years past. Okay. Don't ever look at your portfolio and say, wow, why did I did that? You want to look at it and say, I know why I did that. What's next? All right. So that's a killer question. Thank you. Aloha state of mind. I would continue to add position on the S&P 500. You could do that. Dollar cost average it. Absolutely. Um, especially if you're looking at those, uh, um, you know, those, um, you know, those, those lower amounts. Okay. Um, if you're talking, if you're trying to get to that first $10,000 goal that I talk about all the time, um, certainly want to continue funding that um, as aggressively as you can. I have VOO, then four other solid stocks. You're suggesting to just keep adding to VOO. Um, yeah, I, I don't I don't know if, if there's any time at all to kind of take your foot off of the accelerator on putting money into um, the S&P 500. Now is the time. OK, um, so when I say invest as much as you can into the S&P 500, that's relatively speaking. OK. Um, do I think you need to be max funding the Roth IRA right now and struggling to do so? Absolutely not. You could justify cutting that contribution in half, do 200 and then do 200 to, to cash. That's the, that's the winning mentality I want you guys to take. If you don't have one single dime of cash saved up on the side, then this might be a time to take that foot off the accelerator a little bit on the S&P 500 and go ahead and start to strategically funny, funnel some money into cash. Okay. It's very, very prudent to do so. If you get a 10% hiccup, maybe you take the $200 contribution and bump it back up to 250, right? You see that strategic application. It's just a little bit more strategic to say, look, the stock market's at an all time high. I'm not going to ignore it. I'm going to acknowledge it. Okay. And that's the key part of this message. Okay. Uh, sale VXS. Okay. I got, I got to scan through here, guys, and then I am going to wrap it up a little bit. Thanks for the feedback. Thank you, Ryan, for inspiring me to invest and get off the sidelines. I'm glad to do it, man. You, you've been empowered. I'm so happy to bring the message to you. Um, it's stuff that I personally do in my life, um, and, and we're, we're just a brother in investing now, um, and, and I'm glad to share it with, with everybody. I've had a few few people. I've had Teresa hit me up tonight as well um, with that type of validation. And I'm glad to do it. I only ask that you please validate this information for yourself. Okay. I, I really want you to do it because it makes sense to you and not because it's something that I've told you you have to do or anybody else has told you. Make it make sense for you. I'm very passionate about that. Okay. Because rest assured, as good as the stock market can be, and investing is extremely rewarding. Okay it can be also very, very humbling as well. Okay. I, again, I'm just talking, I'm just speaking the truth. That's it. Okay. Hey Ryan, which do you prefer growth or dividend stocks and what percentage of your portfolio should be in bonds? So right now I've got 10%. And I think with the, right now with about the monetary amount that I'm looking at, at, at well over 300,000 now, I've got about 10 percent of my portfolio, my invested portfolio in bonds, which is around 20 grand right now. 10 percent. OK, uh, for a younger investor who is working in their 20s, 30s or even 40s, maybe even 50s. OK, there could be substantiation for having a 100 percent stock portfolio. OK. I don't want to limit you guys with a bunch of rules, okay? And depending on the other criteria that I insist upon, risk tolerance, investment capital saved, retirement, pension plans, etc., debt that you may have, it may be absolutely prudent for you to keep your foot on that accelerator because you're young enough to do so. If you're young, all right, you could have a, a good mix of growth and income in your portfolio. I always say that I want folks to look to start um, with the uh, value in their portfolio. You know, your Apple, your Microsoft, 
you know, your Disney, your Procter and Gamble, J and J, um, JP Morgan Chase, get some of those major players in your portfolio. So you can start to get an understanding of what it means to be an investor first, and then start to add some of that growth in there. Now there's some of those high growth names that their valuations justify taking a small position in. There is an additional risk to investing in a Facebook as opposed to right now investing in, let's say, a Home Depot or an Apple Computers. Okay, There's just a different level of risk. If you want to increase that level of risk, try going out and looking at a Salesforce.com or looking at an Amazon, Okay, which trade at astronomical multiples. Okay. That's the level of where I'm at. now. Am I recommending not to buy Amazon? If you have the buy, the means to do so, by all means, buy the stock. That's fine. Um, but I certainly want you guys to get a diversified base first, a value suite of stocks in your portfolio. Then you can go ahead and expand into more of the growth avenue. And that value and growth can be done kind of at the same time if that's what you prefer. I tend not to write too many rules. What I do is I throw out fundamental philosophies to say, look, Ryan's talking about a 50-50 portfolio. He's talking about a 75% diversified ETF with the, with the top 25% in stock. That sounds good to me. Or I'm a young whippersnapper. I just want to throw everything in the stock market. Can I do that, Ryan? Absolutely. Absolutely you can. So the portfolio building tools that I recommend all the time really have to be appropriate for the age level, the bracket, the risk tolerance, et cetera, the investment goals that are appropriate for that individual that is um, looking to deploy that specific portfolio building. And it can change over time as well. Um, there's no right or wrong allocation. Um, so right now I'm 60-40, okay? 60% 60 equities, 40% uh, and out of that 40%, like I said, I have 10% bonds and the remaining 30% in cash. That's just where I'm at right now. Okay. Um, that's companies. Yep. So guys, I'm, I am going to kind of wrap it up. I've got Ernesto here. He's hitting me up and I, I think I'm going to take Ernesto's question as the last Ryan, a hundred thousand dollar account invested in blue chip stocks. Okay. To keep in the current market. Oh, that's a really tough question. I, I think depending on whether or not you're sitting on some profit, um, I would say that if you are sitting on a nice share of cash as well, um, you could justify more keeping that hundred thousand dollars invested in the, in the stock market. Okay. Um, with that said, if you don't have a lot of cash savings, let's say you're sitting on twenty thousand dollars or less of cash, um, you, you could look to pare back on some of those positions strategically. Okay. Now I'm not telling you to do this. All right. Um, but if you have had some of your um, really good winners run up quite nicely, um, look about taking some profit out of that and keeping a little bit in there to play on some house money, okay, in case some of those continue to, to, to go up, all right? Um, but you could definitely look to pare back on some of those positions, and now's the time to do it, okay? You can't come back to me and say, Ryan, I asked you the $100,000 question when the stock market was at an all-time high. We're in the midst of a bear market. We're down 30%. What in the hell, what the hell did you get me into? Right. And I'm going to point back to this very discussion that we're having and the convenience of our, you know, our discussion forum here on YouTube when nobody else seemingly is having these discussions in the stock market right now. And I absolutely love to open up the envelope on this question because it's prudent to talk about this line of thinking anytime. OK, not just when it's conveniently at an all time high. I think about this stuff all the time. OK, um, I've got uh, keep in the market if you're staying in for 20 years plus. Yep. Good. Um, when setting up my M1 account, should I click it for general investing or retirement account? I'm not sure, but I plan on using that for stocks only. Um, if you're eligible to open up your retirement account, that is the one that you want to open. If you already have a Roth IRA account, um, you can't start two, unfortunately. Um, but if you do not have a retirement account, that is absolutely the option that you want to take. You take the brokerage account option after you've already started your retirement account. So thank you, Mike, for that question. Um, 
I've got Tim on the line. I'm just scrolling through here trying to hit all the questions. You guys are filling this up faster than I can answer them. Um, but I, I've got Tim Tellers. How, how does selling work if you own some shares longer than a year, but some shares less than a year? Uh, does it depend exactly when you buy each share? Yes, it does. Anything less than 365 is a short-term sale. Um, you will be taxed on that. Um, anything that you've kept long-term will be uh, subject to long-term capital gains. And depending on your income will determine, I think, believe the lower two tax brackets um, exempt you from long-term capital gains on those longer holdings. Um, so you are eligible to sell those in most cases tax-free. So that's a killer question. Thank you, Tim. Guys, I have lost my voice officially. I, I lost it for you. I've given you my voice. I've given you my heart. I've given you my mind tonight. Um, and I'm glad to do it. I hope this provoked thought tonight in really thinking about your own investment uh, portfolios, your own investment goals, what you want out of the stock market. If you have the luxury of taking some positional power back out of the stock market, it's prudent to do so at times, all right? If you do have a long-term horizon, stay long, stay the course on the stock market and find those other strategic areas in the stock market where you can potentially build up some of those cash reserves to take advantage of those rainy days when they happen. Guys, thank you so much for joining the group tonight. This was the best live feed I've ever offered. That's why I stuck with you guys for a little bit of bonus time tonight. Um, but I have lost my voice officially and I don't want to press it anymore. So guys, thank you again. Good luck in your investment future. We will see you next Friday. Thank you so much.